Well, good morning and greetings in Christ's name this morning. Um, that's why we're here, you know, and um, that's how we can be uh, part of this family that Brother Dwight was enthusing about. I enjoyed that. Um, glad for relationships that are healthy and growth promoting, uh, encouraging, etc. That because of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so, I'd like to think about today living, walking in the Spirit or living and walking after the flesh. And what are some of the differences in the outcome? And what does it look like to live and walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and what does it look like to live and walk after the flesh? And <clears throat> we are reminded often that we're still in the flesh. Some of the adult Sunday school lesson was talking about that and a um, question about... Um, how, how do we relate with authority? How, how do we live um, in obedience to those in authority over us? Submitting ourselves to every ordinance of man and so on. Um, how should that look on a daily basis and, you know, in our business life? So we didn't get into a lot of the details I think would have been um, good to talk about in that, but it was good to think about and it's good to realize um, that there is a difference that takes place in our lives when we are born again and when we're living and walking in the Spirit. So the wind blows where it wants to, right? Jesus says this, and you, you hear and you see the effects of it, but you don't know where it really comes from, where did it originate, and where is it going to? It's in a hurry, air moving in a hurry, and we sometimes get to experience that. And I remember as a child, the, um, there's just something happens when um, there's a, we lived in Texas for a few years, a lot of Texas, and there were the, these blue northers come through. And there would be, it's hot, could be 100 degrees, and here comes this, you can see a line of clouds coming, and it's dark clouds. And with that comes this fresh, cold, strong wind. And it would change the temperature just, I mean, in just like a half a minute, you drop, you could drop 50 degrees. And <clears throat> so it was very um, exciting. Something happened in us little school children that we just got kind of wild over that time. I mean, just things were exciting. There's something about the pressure of the air. I don't know exactly what it is, but um, it changed the way we acted for a little while. And so... Jesus says this is how it is when you are born of the Spirit. You can see a change in somebody's life. You can see their behavior is different. Maybe you can't tell why. And we like to be able to come up with this formula of how my life can change that's, um, that we can just, you know, Xerox copy and hand it out. And then everybody can have the same kind of behavior all the time. But it doesn't work like that. The Spirit of God works in us to change us, the power of God by His Spirit. So I'd like to um, just turn to chapter 7 of Romans. <clears throat> we come to repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 20, verse 21. We're born again. There is wonderful life amazing liberty and joy in the Holy Ghost. You've experienced it if you've been born again. You know what that's like. There's something so fresh. It's like that blue norther has chased away that hot weather that is just about wilting you. And now you've got this fresh air, lots of oxygen, and there's something about it is just so much more exciting and beautiful than before. And so, we're enthusiastic, we're thankful, we're appreciative of what God has done in us, and our relationships with those around us is just rich, lush, pleasant. 
What could possibly be better? This is the good life, and we expect it to continue indefinitely. We might even be and feel like on fire for God, and we're telling people about Jesus as we encounter them. Oh, this person is depressed. This person's got all these stressors in life and stuff. And we say, but Jesus is the answers for all of these things. You got that deep trouble in your life? You may have an addiction. Jesus can take care of all of that. And so we're excited about it, and we tell people about Jesus. So we're on fire for God. But along comes a critic that wets your wood, maybe a little cup of water. Uh, maybe it's just a little sideways look that, uh, or kind of an unkind remark, or something like that. And maybe they have a water hose. Um, well, you don't enjoy it, and in all probability you react in a way that shows you still have feelings inside or that come up that are not so sanctified. So it's a little different than it was just before that there's some heat comes back up. <clears throat> Perhaps a bit shopping, shocking to you um, what your brother or sister did and often it's somebody that's close to us that makes us react or we react the most to. Um, perhaps your feelings surprise you, your response shakes you. What is going on? I thought things were good. I didn't realize I still have this stuff in me that's, there's some junk there. And uh, maybe you're not, you don't analyze it that way to begin with, but maybe later on. But the realities of spiritual life, the living and walking in the spirit versus the flesh, hits you right square in the face. It's an unpleasant reality. That we're still living in the flesh. We still have these emotions, these responses, and people still do things that hurt us. And it actually still hurts sometimes. And maybe the more mature we are, the less it hurts. But there's still something in us that we have to deal with on a regular basis. And that's our flesh, because we still live here. We still have emotions. We still have the flesh to deal with. So Romans chapter 7, verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's when we were before Christ, outside of Christ. And the law was designed to um, help us live in a way that we could be acceptable to God. That's the Old Testament law. It was designed for that, but then we realize it really is what it is, and this is what God says, is it's a schoolmaster, a teacher, if you would, to bring us to Christ. To show us that we need Jesus. We cannot, outside of Jesus, live in such a way as to be um, able to be in God's presence, to please our holy God. Let's go on down to chapter, or verse 14 of chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. It's a contrary thing. This flesh, the old me, just stubborn and might even think it's just plumb dumb. Why do I do those things? Why do I respond the way that I do? It's not what I want, but it's what I do. <clears throat> Verse 16, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will, to have a desire, is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I, I know what I should do, but I just can't. I don't have the ability. I can't work it out. I can't make it reality. I know what should be, but it's just not in me to do this. 
For the good that I would, I do not, verse 19 says, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Ah, I didn't want to react. I knew it was going to be a tough situation, but I didn't want to react. I had chosen not to, but I did anyway. So what am I going to do about it? Verse verse 20, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Let's not let that continue, right? Let's not let it dwell there, live there. If it happens to come by, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, if a person is overtaken in a fault, not living there, but overtaken, so something has come up and I have sinned. I find then a law, verse 21 says, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. That's in my flesh. That's the body I live in. and My old way of thinking and acting and living that keeps my body trapped, as it were, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who is going to save me from this? From myself, really, right? Who's going to save me from me? Well, he doesn't leave us there with that question. He gives us an answer, and that is, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So I've come to faith in Christ. Things have been good. I've been just um, enjoying the new birth experience, new life. The joy of knowing Christ. The joy of having my sins forgiven. Washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's this fellowship with my brothers and sisters that's rich. And then something happens that breaks that. And brings sharply into my vision. Just like this big thing in my path. I've got some problems still. I'm still living in the flesh. There's a shadow, I think, was mentioned this morning. It's cast across somebody's life. Well, maybe it was my life that the shadow was cast across. But that brings a realization that I've got some of my own issues. Some of the things that I need Jesus to continue that work in me. There is hope. In, we read in the last verse, in Christ Jesus. Thanking God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, coming back to worshiping God and coming back to Him knowing, God, I need your help to continue. You've started well. I've plugged into this, but I realize now I've got problems that only you can fix. So... <clears throat> What does it look like to walk after the Spirit? And we could look at, and maybe we should, it was read this morning also, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And this is single, singular, not plural. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And that's what I had for my brother. And I don't know why they didn't respond in kind. Why did somebody get cranky with me or critical of something I did? I had good motivation and had good motives for what I did. Uh, Maybe it came out a little crooked. Or I didn't think about how it would look to somebody else. But you didn't have to hit me over the head with that two by four. Um, that hurt and made me angry. Um, So love helps us to bear all things, right? Even the criticisms. And 
was mentioned this morning also. Let's actually analyze those things, right? It wasn't quite worded like that, but the thought being there. Um, God speaks through people. And it may be just a simple way of getting our attention that you still have the flesh to deal with. You're still in the body and you're still subject to temptations. <clears throat> so, fruit of the Spirit is love, there's joy, there is peace, there is long-suffering. And we could use the word patience, but I think long-suffering is a little bit more pictorial. It gives us the idea that there's a lot of time spent and it's not all fun, right? So long-suffering, uh, we could think patience, but the picture, the word picture here is, uh, amplifies that. Gentleness, so I'm not harsh with other people, I don't respond harshly. Whoa, somebody. There's a minister who's no longer living that one time said um, somebody would come at me and fire with the, you know, their shotgun at me. I had a double barrel. I would fire right back. Oh, that's not the gentleness, is it? Well, after gentleness, there's goodness and there's faith. And I think of God's gentleness has made us great. God's gentleness is what elevates us. If he was harsh with us, where would we be? But he's been gentle with us. And we ought to have a full confidence in him. Not just a little bit, but faith is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Meekness. So humility and uh, power under control, not out of control. And then temperance. So self-discipline, um, the ability to control my appetites and my time. And well, those things that I have, being able to utilize them well and control <laughs> what I get involved in and so on. So not indulging the flesh. Against such there is no law. And then he continues with this. And they that are Christ's have what? <clears throat> Crucified the flesh. Now, there, is, um, there was in the news several months ago um, something I noted and, and copied actually and paste it into my notes that it was just about a somebody in I believe it was in Britain was discovered at the body of somebody who'd been crucified and they excavated this skeleton and they actually built a face so now we have a face to put with this skeleton of somebody who'd been crucified and crucifixion they they reference back to Jesus and he was the most famous person to be crucified, right? I mean, there are a lot of other people who are crucified, but we read about Jesus, and people all over the world know about Jesus being crucified. It was one of the most cruel ways to kill somebody. So the merciful way was used to just behead them, just chop the head off, but to, to make it miserable and torture the person uh, beforehand and then hang them on a cross, this long, slow, miserable way to die. And so they that are Christ have long, slow death of their flesh, right? They've crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, the things that my flesh really wants. I've put it on the cross. It's suffering. Now, as long as I'm alive in this body, I need to keep it there. Long, difficult, painful. That's the implication. So something about my flesh doesn't want to die. I can't just kill it and it's done. 
And sometimes the discovery is that thing has gotten off the cross again. I've taken it down. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's let our lives bear it out. We say we have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, in us. And we, are, we want to be filled, anyways, with the Spirit. Brother Dwight prayed that, I don't remember exactly, I prayed that the Spirit of God would be anoint me or something like that this morning. And I appreciate that. I need that. I need the Spirit of God to fill me, to speak to and then through me. And I need to walk out in business, in my relationship in my home with my wife. There are some things that um, we think differently about. How do I relate with that? Do I demand my way? What about with my children? How do I do with that responsibility? Do I love them enough to discipline them, not to snap at them? But do I have a vision like God does? The Spirit of God tells me through the Word how to treat my children, to train them, raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, discipline them. This is something that is God says to do. So do I do this? And so as I live daily life, how do I walk after the Spirit? Or in the Spirit, rather. <clears throat> then he goes on to say, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Something that's good for me for right now. Makes me look good, maybe. Provoking one another, poking at each other. Hey, you know, what are you doing that for? Uh, because of me, not because of what's best for them. Envying one another, being envious of somebody who's more successful than I'm in whatever means. It could be in popularity, it could be in business acumen, it could be in relationships. Some people are very, very um, relational. And it seems like they have friends on every side, people all over just uh, keeping track of them, wanting to keep in contact with them and come visit them and so on. And maybe I don't. Maybe I get a little bit envious of somebody who's like that, you know, more popular or more gifted in business or whatever it might be. How do I respond? Let's not be that way. That's a carnal way of living. And the first 10 verses of chapter 6 are some, just some real practical things about um, living and walking in the Spirit. And it, I'll just read verses 7 through 10. It would be worth looking at all of them, but I think we should probably only look at these. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So, what are you sowing to? Are you feeding the spirit or the flesh? Are you coming into the presence of God on a daily basis, asking Him to give you an appetite, an appetite for His Word? And then, actually reading it, meditating on it, maybe journaling. What did God show me in His Word today? So I want to remember this and think about it through the day. God, thank you for that. Do I spend time in prayer? Do I come to Him when I wake up at night? I didn't used to do this that much. Wake up at night and something on my mind or just can't sleep. Used to get, if I, that happened, I would get aggravated. But now, uh, maybe God wants to talk with me for a while. Maybe He wants me to talk to Him for a while or listen to Him. Maybe he wants me to spend time reading his word. How do I respond to those things? What do I invest time in? Um, time with God. And rich time with God. Not just, okay, so I'm going to pray for 15 minutes or whatever. 
But no, time with God, this is what I'm doing. This is why we're gathered today, right? To worship God. So we do this with intentionality. And um, when we sow to that, we're going to reap that. When we sow to the flesh, we maybe want to sleep in in the morning. And then, oh, we don't have time for the word of God. We don't have time to spend in prayer. We've got to rush off because now we've got to go to work or school or whatever it might be. And, or maybe, maybe you, have, you spend time with God during the day sometime or in the evening. And so your timeline might be different than mine, but do you take the time or does your life just get hectic and you forget about that? You will find yourself tending towards walking in the flesh instead of the spirit. So be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth. Whatever you plant, you're going to reap. You're going to harvest that. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. What do I read? What do I listen to? What do I talk about? What am I focused on? Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You don't always find, you don't always feel the richness of the presence of God when you spend time with Him. You don't always feel that right then. But don't get tired of doing that. Don't give it up. Keep on pressing into that. Spend time with God. He will, when it's time, He will give you your reward. You will reap that. The, what you've sown. As ye have therefore opportunity, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, <clears throat> can you identify a person who walks after the spirit or the flesh by their appearance? Hmm. Well, I'm a little bit self-conscious this morning. I was. I was tempted to be, I should say. <laughs> so I... I don't have a suit coat on. Um, I don't always wear one at home, but Brother Dwight and his dad both have suit coats, and there are some others of you that do as well. Um, the first time I came here, there were white shirts and black pants, and I had green, sh green pants and a yellow shirt. And I was mm, like, is this fellow really, you know, I was wondering about that. Well, Brother Dwight had a blue shirt on, so I was, whew. I, I was relieved. But can we tell by just looking at somebody if they're living and walking after the Spirit? What do we use to, to know? How do we know? Well, the wind blows where it wants to. You hear the sound. You see the effects. But you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going to. That's kind of how people that are born of the Spirit are. You can't really tell where the power is coming from. And you may not be able to know exactly what the results are going to look like. <clears throat> Can you tell who walks after the spirit or after the flesh by their language? Well, I'm not meaning Spanish or English or some other language. I'm meaning vocabulary. There are some indicators, right? <laughs> there can be some indicators in the, the way we dress. There can be some indicators in the vocabulary we use. Like, we wouldn't expect somebody that's full of the Spirit to use foul language, would we? No. We'd expect the language to be that which is becoming holiness or appropriate to holiness. The same with the clothing. Um, well, maybe not yellow shirt versus white shirt, but, you know, it's like immodest versus modest. There's a be, you know, give us a little clue anyways. Is this person, does this person care about what God cares about is really what it comes down to. And so, what about uh, mannerisms? Um, what about relational or emotional strengths or weaknesses? What about financial position or financial management? What about eloquence or lack of eloquence? There are some people who don't speak a lot, but their words are very powerful. There are some people who speak a lot, and it doesn't mean much. What about, 
can you tell by somebody that's willing to take risks versus somebody who's risk averse? Hey, there's a new venture. Let's try it. Oh, no, we, we're not sure about all that. Let's, let's stay with the safe. Risk indulgence, risk aversion. What about popularity, unpopularity? Um, critical or uncritical person? Um, hmm. Well, I have some thoughts about that. But uh, if there's somebody that sees a problem and points it out, I'm glad for that if it's about me and if it's actual real problem or flaw that I have. I appreciate that. And I believe the Spirit of God speaks through people to us. I believe somebody who's going to be a critic, have a critical spirit, is not necessarily by the Spirit of God, though. There are people who have no, they've never been born again that can have that kind of, do the same kind of thing. But if somebody can point out a flaw in my life and then say, here's a solution, or here's something that I think has helped me in the past, those kind of things are much more, um, gives me the sense that maybe there's the Spirit of God speaking through that person more than just the critical spirit. <clears throat> what about the naive person? Um, just quick to believe anything and everything, and especially good things about people. <laughs> you know, it's the incorrigible optimist, maybe. Um, or somebody who's just simply um, the opposite of that, cynical. They can't see any good in anybody. Just the whole world's against me. Is that an indicator of Holy Spirit or flesh living in or after the Holy Spirit or after the flesh? Well, some of those things are indicators to us, but they don't, they're not really the definitive um, way of knowing. Indulgent or temperate person uh, towards myself, um, what about um, the way I relate with other people? Harsh, strict, severe uh, towards others. And what about myself? Do I, do I um, judge myself or am I prone to judge you all? Um, how, how, do I, how do I relate with people? How do I think about others? Do I think in a way that's charitable? kind, thoughtful, loving. And sometimes that includes a rebuke, right? It's not always just everything's happy and so on, but if I see my brother that's in danger or my sister that's in danger and I care about them, I'm going to address that too. But how do I think about? Do I judge myself and have grace or peace towards others? Um, those are indicators of flesh or spirit controlled person. <clears throat> what about myself? Now, you think about this. Have I, do I have the ability to tell or to know when my flesh has gotten off the cross? Or as Paul says, um, he keeps under his body, right? He keeps it under. He keeps it down like I think of a balloon in water. You just got to hold it down. If you let go, it pops right back up. Or a helium balloon. You got to hold it or tie it onto something or it goes up. Um, so do I know when my flesh has gotten out from under or off the cross? Can I tell? And um, probably we say... Um, at some point, we come to that realization, right? At some point, we know if we've been walking after the Spirit and the Spirit has been guiding us, directing our lives, we've been walking with God, we may not be aware immediately when the flesh gets out of control again, gets off the cross. But at some point, we become aware of that. Then what do we do with it? Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5 yet. <clears throat> verses 1 through 20. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And I'll just read this, maybe make a few comments, and then we'll need to call it quits. 
Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So here's just, just think about this as the general um, MO, modus operandi, of a child of God's, a spirit filled, somebody who's walking after the, the spirit, not after the flesh. Be ye followers of God as dear children. So this is just general way we live if we want to live and walk in the spirit. Be a follower of God as dear children. Now, my little children couldn't always do what they were supposed to do or didn't always, and I know I didn't when I was young. But if I wanted to be like somebody, I would watch that person. I would try to do what they did because I admired them or I loved them. Well, this is how we ought to be with God. Admire Him, love Him, want to be like Him, like a dear child, just Reverence in God, be in awe of Him and follow Him. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given Himself for us. A, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. There's our example. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Avoid those things. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather, rather than those things, giving of thanks. There's something about a heart that's full of thankfulness, gratitude, that just makes life different. It's like it takes away all the dark and cloudy things. It's like cleaning the windows so you can actually see out and see what there is out there. Verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, that was your past, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And I'd like to just stop and think about this just a little bit. A little comment on verse 13. Reproof, we don't really like that. But when it brings junk to the light, the junk in my own heart, the junk in my own life to the light. I thank God for that. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Hallelujah. See then that ye walk circumspectly. That's being aware, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's a semicolon there, so it's not really the end of a thought, but I think we'll just stop there. There's relationships, follow that. So thinking about relationships are important. Relationships, first of all, with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, being restored is a tremendous blessing and treasure to us. Let's kneel for prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning for your great love to us. Thank you that you have not only given us reconciliation through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, and liberty 
liberty from the flesh to do what is right, to walk in uprightness before you, but your Spirit, your Holy Spirit who is with us, in us. And I pray, Lord God, you help us to live, walk, and move in the power of your Holy Spirit. Bless each one here today with hearts lifted up in your ways. We pray that you receive glory and honor through the church, this congregation here, and the one back home, and those represented here today, and others who aren't even represented here today. Bless each one of us, Lord, with the power to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts on a daily basis. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.